Part 1. You will hear a woman talking on the telephone to a man about a car he is selling. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, Brian Park speaking. Oh, hello. I'm calling about the advert in the paper. For the car? Uh, yes, the Mini you've got advertised for sale. Oh, yes. I just wanted to find out a bit more information. Of course. What would you like to know? It's my brother who's interested, actually. But he's not in today, so he asked me to call you. Fine. Great, thanks. So, it's a Mini? Yep. And how old is it? Just coming up to 13 years old. And I seem to remember from the ad that it's grey. That's it. Doesn't show the dirt. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, the colour shouldn't be a problem for Jeff. You know, the important thing is the quality. Yes, of course. And what about mileage? With it being pretty old, it's probably over 100,000? Actually, it's 40,000 less than that. 62,000 on the clock. Great. I remember now. I'm confusing it with another ad I was looking at. Right. Pleasant surprise, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been the only owner, or was there a previous one? I'm the second one. Before, it was owned by a teacher, who was a very careful driver, didn't have any accidents. Very good. And what about you? What do you tend to use it for? I haven't used it all that much, mostly for shopping. You know, this sort of thing. So, not much wear and tear. I'll make a note of that. I know Jeff wanted me to check that. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, about the price, I see you've got it down as £1,250. I'm not sure Jeff will be able to come up with that amount. In the ad, I did say £1,250 or nearest offer. So, would you be prepared to go down to £1,000? That's really too low, I'm afraid. £1,100? I might be able to go to that. OK, I'll make a note of that. What about tax? Is it due soon? Got another five months before it's due. Oh, that's a real plus, yes. I'll make a note of that. OK. Now, you say it's in good condition. For its age, I'd say yes, definitely. It's just been serviced and there were no major problems. Major? I'd be able to show you the service report. The only thing is, you'd have to get a new tyre in the near future. Though it's still OK, you know. It's certainly absolutely safe at the moment. OK, fair enough. Yes, I understand. And the garage also mentioned that one headlight could probably do with replacing. They think there's a fault there, you know, intermittent... Well, we'd obviously look at all the documents, but that sounds very straightforward. Of course. I've got all the service documents up to date, and you can look at those. Well, it all sounds pretty good, and I know my brother will be interested. So, would it be possible for him to see the car? He's back from his trip tomorrow, and away tonight. So, how about tomorrow? Tomorrow? Wednesday? I'm, I'm afraid that's not possible. I'm out pretty much all day. 
Well, Thursday then? That'd be fine, yeah. In the morning? Yes, that'd suit me perfectly. Great. Now, you'll need my address. Oh, yes, of course. What is it? It's number 238. 238? London Road. Oh, that's easy enough. Yes, very straightforward. So I'll pass on these notes to Jeff, and he'll see you in a couple. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given to new employees at a museum. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 13. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Peter Myers, and on behalf of everybody here at Stevensbridge Dungeons, I would like to welcome you all to our entertainment team. This year, the hiring process was especially competitive, and it might interest you all to know that for every position, there were almost 30 applicants, so you really are the best of the best. In a moment, I will take you on a tour of the museum so you can get an idea of what the space is like. But first of all, I would like to show you around the staff room. Our staff room is located at the back of the building over here. You will notice that there are two entrances to the staff room. One leads to the room we're in now, which is the main and oldest dungeon here at Stevensbridge, which we have turned into the museum. This is where you will greet the new visitors and also where the tour throughout the dungeons will begin. I should mention now that we only ever send visitors through as part of a group, so even on the busy days you will still get roughly 10 minutes of free time between each group. Make sure you use that time wisely, because you'll need to get straight back into character as soon as it's over. Now look at questions 14 to 20. Right, follow me and I'll show you the layout of the museum. From the museum, we can pass through this door near the interactive display into the staff room. From here, you can see the steps at the far side in the opposite corner that lead outside into Berwick Street. When you arrive for a shift, it will be much easier for you all to come in the Berwick Street entrance directly down the steps to the staff room. If you come in through the main visitor entrance, it will take you longer to get past security. As you can all see, there are lockers on your right-hand side. Uh, they should be big enough for you to put your bags and coats in. You'll get given keys later that work with any of the lockers in here. Over on the other side, past the lockers, is our most exciting area. This is where our wardrobe and makeup will take place. Every shift, you will be transformed from normal people into grotesque medieval prisoners. If you're lucky, you get to be the jailer but even they rarely bathed in those days. Of course, some of you might consider yourselves method actors, but please do try to shower before your shift. We don't want to give visitors an experience that's too authentic. 
Now, we do have a staff shower here if you really need it. It is located next to the staff toilets, which are unisex. I hope nobody has too much of a problem with that. Unfortunately, dungeons were not really designed with comfort in mind. You can find the bathroom at the other end of the room from the makeup area. There is also another toilet for the public, concealed just to the right of the door into this room. Let's move back into the museum. We have three main sections down here. The first one you pass into when you leave the staff room is the museum. This is where all the useful information can be found such as dates, number of prisoners and the kinds of torture that were used. I know it's a lot of information to take in on your first day, but try to learn as much of it as you can. Even though you'll mostly be in character, visitors might want to ask you some questions and it would be great if you could tell them more about the dungeons. I think it would be more interesting if visitors could learn directly from you rather than having to read about it. As you can see, on the left we have an interactive display for children and on the right we have a photo booth. This was the original dungeon, first built in 1435. Now, let's pass through into the main dungeon that was added during the Tudor period in around 1570. You might be able to feel that the air is a lot damper and cooler here. That is because we are now beneath the River Stevens. This is primarily the room in which most of you will be working. This is where many high-profile religious figures were held, sometimes for years on end. Depending on the roles you'll be playing, you can either be chained up, free to roam, or, if you're a jailer, wandering between prisoners to keep an eye on them. Now we will pass into our third and final section, the prison cells. Over here, you can see there are some wooden stocks and a fake gibbet. <laughs> don't worry, I can see a couple of you looking concerned. You don't need to reenact any of the torture scenes for visitors. One person each shift will play the jailer in here, where you will give a speech to the group about some of the more notable prisoners to stay here in the past. This is usually the end of the tour, but some visitors will certainly want to ask you more questions at this point, so please try your best to make yourselves available. Help them by answering any questions they have. Also, feel free to guide the visitors through the museum if you see that they're going the wrong way. This concludes our introduction to your new workplace. If you'll please follow me, I will get you all issued with your keys and some information about the dungeons that you can take home with you to study. I will also introduce you to your shift supervisor, Alice Stiles, and you can ask her any questions you may have about your roles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two conversations. Are based on the following conversation. The answer should be appropriate to the content of this conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. 
Oh, hi, Dave. Long time no see. Hi, Maria. I just settled down. I thought I'd drop by. Come on in. Take a seat. Would you like anything to drink? I have Sprite and orange juice. Sprite would be fine. Oh, so how have you been? Oh, not bad. And you? Oh, I'm doing okay. But school has been really busy these days, and I haven't had time to relax. By the way, what's your major? Hotel management. Well, what do you want to do once you graduate? Um, I haven't decided for sure, but I think I'd like to work for a hotel or travel agency in this area. How about you? Well, when I first started college, I wanted to major in French, but I realised I might have a hard time finding a job using the language, so I changed my major to computer science. With the right skills, landing a job in the computer industry shouldn't be too difficult. So, do you have a part-time job to support yourself through school? Well, fortunately for me, I received a four-year academic scholarship that pays for all of my tuition and books. Wow, that's great! Yeah, how about you? Are you working your way through school? Yeah, I work three times a week at a restaurant near campus. Oh, what do you do there? I'm a cook. How do you like your job? It's okay. The other workers are friendly, and the pay isn't bad. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Several days later, Dave and Maria met on campus. So, what do you want to do tomorrow? Well, let's look at this city guide here. Um, here's something interesting. Why don't we first visit the art museum in the morning? Okay, I like that idea. And、um, where do you want to have lunch? How about going to an Indian restaurant? The guide recommends one downtown, a few blocks from the museum. Now that sounds great. After that, what do you think about visiting the zoo? Well, it says here that there are some very unique animals not found anywhere else. Well, to tell the truth, I'm not really interested in going there. Yeah, why don't we go shopping instead? There are supposed to be some really nice places to pick up souvenirs. No, I don't think that's a good idea. We only have a few travelers' checks left, and I only have fifty dollars left in cash. No problem. We can use your credit card to pay for my clothes. Oh no! I remember the last time you used my credit card for your purchases. Oh well. Let's take the subway down to the seashore and walk along the beach. Now that sounds like a wonderful plan. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a man talking on the radio about dogs which help people with their work. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this week's edition of Countrywide. And today, we're taking a look at a number of different breeds of working dogs. And here to report on the dogs with jobs is Kevin Thornhill. Thanks, Joanne. Well, yes, dogs with jobs is the subject of today's program. Dogs have earned themselves a reputation over the centuries for being extremely loyal. And here's a little story which illustrates just how loyal they are. Just outside the country town of Gundagai in Australia is a statue built to commemorate a dog. A dog which sat waiting for his owner to return to the spot where he'd left him. Well, the story, which was immortalised in a song, has it that the poor dog died waiting for his master, five miles from Gundagai, which is where they built the statue. Now that's what I call loyalty. Well, because of their loyalty and also their ability to learn practical skills, dogs can be trained to do a number of very valuable jobs. Perhaps the most well-known of working dogs is the Border Collie Sheepdog. Sheep dogs which work in unison with their masters need to be smart and obedient, with a natural ability to herd sheep. Some farmers say that their dogs are so smart that they not only herd sheep, they can count them too. Another much-loved working dog is the guide dog, trained to work with the blind. Guide dogs, usually Labradors, need to be confident enough to lead their owner through traffic and crowds, but they must also be of a gentle nature. It costs a great deal of money to train a dog for this very valuable work, but the guide dog associations in the UK, America and Australia receive no government assistance, so all the money comes from donations. Another common breed of work dog is the German Shepherd. German Shepherds make excellent guard dogs and are also very appropriate as search and rescue dogs, working in disaster zones after earthquakes and avalanches. These dogs must be tough and courageous to cope with the arduous conditions of their work, and so that they can be sent anywhere in the world to assist in disaster relief operations, effective dogs and their trainers are now listed on an international database. When you arrive at an airport here, you may be greeted in the baggage hall by a detector dog, wearing a little red coat bearing the words quarantine. These dogs are trained to sniff out fresh fruit as well as meat and even live animals hidden in people's bags. In order to be effective, a good detector dog must have an enormous food drive. In other words, they must really love their food. At Sydney Airport, where there are 10 detector dogs working full time, they stop about 80 people a month trying to bring illegal goods into the country. And according to their trainers, they very rarely get it wrong. Another famous working dog is the Husky. Huskies, which originally came from Siberia, have been used for decades as a means of transport on snow, particularly in Antarctica where they have played an important role. Huskies are well adapted to harsh conditions and they enjoy working in a team. But the Huskies have all left Antarctica now because the International Treaty prohibits their use in the Territory as they are not native animals. Many people were sad to see the dogs leave Antarctica, as they had been vital to the early expeditions and earned their place in history along with the explorers. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.